So good afternoon and welcome to today's lecture. My name is Meredith Coutrere and I am one of the conveners of the Early Medieval Britain and Ireland network here at the University of, Long, uh, University of Oxford alongside Bobby Clapper and Aloysius Atkinson over to my right. And I am the organizer of our network's academic lecture series. We are a multidisciplinary scholarly community comprised of faculty, staff, and students from across the University of Oxford with an interest in the cultures, languages, and peoples of early medieval Britain and Ireland. Our lecture series provides a forum for leading scholars to present their latest research. We're very pleased to have with us today Dr. Jacqueline Novakowski, a nationally recognized prehistorian, educator, and award-winning archaeologist who has over 40 years of experience as a professional archaeologist with field experience in the UK, Albania, Poland, Germany, and Italy. Dr. Novakowski has lectured and published widely and has featured in numerous media appearances, including with the BBC. She has overseen multiple significant excavations as a principal archaeologist for the Cornwall Archaeological Unit, and she is the current director of the Tintagel Castle Archaeological Research Project for the English Heritage Trust. She has co-authored a monograph coming out in the near future uh, with James Gossip entitled Tintagel Revisited, New Excavations at Tintagel Castle, North Cornwall. Dr. Novakowski, you're very welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Meredith, and thank you so much for the invitation to come and talk to you about Tintagel. Um, Tintagel is a place uh, which many people might be familiar with. Uh, it's certainly a global destination today for many people who come to Britain um, and come to the West Country, come to Cornwall. Um, it's on their bucket list, so to speak. I've got my keypad. Um, I have had an association with this place for quite a long time, and in recent years I was, um, I've been doing this research excavation for English Heritage Trust who manage the castle. They don't own the castle, it's owned by the Prince of Wales, it belongs to the Duchy of Cornwall, um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a managed ancient monument to excavate there. Obviously it's a scheduled ancient monument, you have to have um, special permission and consent, particular consent to do particular types of work. Um, so the work that we've been doing recently is very much focused on trying to understand more about Tintagel in the late antique world and the world of insular um, Britain in the post-Roman period. So we're looking, our interests lie within the, the 5th and 6th centuries, but also beyond too. So um, anyway, um, but in, in order to understand this place, which is a complicated monument, a complicated piece of landscape, you need to know a little bit about the backstory and why a site like Tintagel might actually start to appear uh, within the landscape on, in the horizon at this time. So in the introduction to my talk, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about the part of the world that we're talking about. And of course, we're talking about the far west. We're talking about the peninsula, today modern day Cornwall, which is actually a very short it's not a very large piece of landscape, but it's a maritime peninsula. And the key thing is, is it juts out into the Atlantic zone, we call the Atlantic zone, and it's on that part of Britain which is identified as the Atlantic zone, the, old, the Celtic zone, if you like. It's got a very distinct identity at this period, a very distinct archaeology, very different from when we look across the landscapes to the southeast and onto the Northern Sea area, um, and also very different from looking up into sort of modern day Scotland as well. But these are the key things that we're interested in. We're looking at the sort of time frame from the end of the uh, Western Roman Empire in Britain at this time and looking at a, a period from about the 5th century right up until the um, 1000 um, AD. Um, what, whatever you want to call it, late antique, post-Roman, early medieval, um, we don't use the word dark ages anymore, but it's, it's that sort of murky period that you as historians uh, look, look at through the texts and the um, uh, early, early read, uh, writings about, uh, that were written at this time. Now, I'm going to give you an archaeological talk because I'm talking about potsherds and stones from the ground up, and this is how we're going to look at this site in terms of its 
um, regional context and its wider context and how it's connected to this whole world, this construction of this identity, which is very distinctive at this time. Um, and so Tintagel, as you can see there, pointing um, on the north coast of Cornwall um, in, a, in a place um, which is called Dumnonia, the ancient kingdom. And Tintagel and its history of development, its historical biography, um, helps frame our understandings about when we look at this part of the world um, in t in, at this time. Anyway, so we, we, this is where we're at. And this is what's happening in the wider landscape. Um, famously, people think that the Romans never came to Cornwall. Well, they didn't in exactly the same way as they might have in other parts of southern Britain, um, central Britain, but people were living in this landscape throughout the whole of the Roman period that we call the Romano-British period. And in Cornwall in particular, people were living in enclosed settlements and they are to a penny, typically dense, and they survive in the landscape as these slides show. They are ditched settlement. I mean, so they are ditched bank settlements. So they're defended small villages or small farmsteads, and some of them have very long histories. They might start in the late Iron Age, um, go throughout the Roman period, and some of them might actually still be operational within our uh, time frame of interest, um, the fifth and sixth centuries. <coughs> Um, but not many have been fully excavated. And this is Trithergi, uh, which was excavated in the 1970s by Henrietta Quinnell. Um, she carried out, um, the whole site was threatened by the expansion of the China clay industry. So the whole place had to be excavated. And she revealed in plan for the first time the interior of one of these Romano-British sites. Where, and, and, and in the slide here on the right, you can see the buildings that are clustered around the, um, the edges of the interior of the site. You've got a fine entranceway, you've got, um, you've got both display and fine construction, um, and a rather attractive, but a, a, a very sort of um, distinguished type of settlement within the landscape. And the buildings here are stone-walled, they're oval, they're a very distinctive, distinctive form of architecture. Now, you have to bear that in mind when we look at the stuff we've got on Tintagel. Oops. This is a reconstruction of um, Trithergi in the 5th and 6th century. So you can sort of see these individual buildings within this enclosed settlement. People presumably farm um, families um, headed by the head of the household are living together, kingship groups. And some settlements, like Trithergi, uh, which has got quite high status material culture, um, appears to be quite an important part. Of, it, might have, it might be that some rounds are, have got um, more um, importance than, than others within this wider landscape. But we are talking about people who are living fairly prosperous material lives. They're connected, they're well connected, they're farming, they're trading. They're not insular. It may be Cornwall, it may be the end of the world, but it isn't, it, it isn't that when we look at the archaeology. Um, because th there's connectivity within Cornwall and other parts of southern Britain, um, pottery is moving around the landscape, and we've also got a, a very thriving home-based um, ceramic industry using the gabbroic clays from the lizard um, storage pots eating pots, vessels. So we're, we're looking at not an impoverished, but a fairly thriving um, set of communities across this entire landscape. And we're also looking at connectivity that goes beyond um, the land, across the channel, reaching out to um, France, um, Europe. So these high status objects, the Samian, the amphora, the dressel type of amphora that you get in Central Europe, um, are actually making an appearance, not in great quantities, um, but they are appearing at some of these sites. So this is all to demonstrate to you that um, Cornwall is not out on a limb. It's actually well connected. Um, and that connect connectivity goes back into deepest prehistory. Um, the mineral resources, particularly the metal mineral resources in Cornwall, are particularly attractive and um, um, 
certainly through the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. And of course, the, the, the um, Pythias the Greek, who made his legendary journey from Marseille around, around the Atlantic seaboard up towards um, uh, the Atlantic side island, around Ireland, up towards the Orkneys. He talks about a legendary place, the island of Ictus, where people were trading tin. And down on the right-hand side, you see a, a typical tin ingot. Uh, these um, places here, down at the bottom is St Michael's Mount, right down at the bottom at Land's End, uh, which has got late Roman imported pottery. Some, some sherds have been found there. And the other um, island that you see at the top is Lou Island, which is in southeast Cornwall, dominating an estuary there. So we need to think about um, connectivity, not just within the, the, the landscape of Britain, but also beyond, and um, have a, a very open um, a, a awareness of the influences that are affecting the communities as they develop throughout the, the Roman period and into the late Roman period. And then, of course, we also see towards the end of the period, some sites are coming up, dominance within the landscape, um, showing a high visibility of elite type behaviour, multiple ramparts on um, small hill forts like this one that you see on the top right there, which is Chun Castle, a fantastic site in, in the Land's End district of Cornwall. This is the entrance where you can see down there on the bottom um, with evidence for reuse beyond the 4th century. Limited evidence, but showing us that we've got this visibility of elites and, and settlements with possibly higher status than others. And of course, we've also got the phenomenon of over 80 inscribed stones that, that, that are scattered throughout the landscape in Cornwall, um, which is related to the, the type of archaeology that you get in southwest Wales, where you get the names of people inscribed on these large standing stones. And these aren't burial monuments. These are more like memorial monuments. And, and here you get the Roman tradition of putting people's names onto granite. Granite is a very, very difficult type of rock in order to inscribe anything. So you can just see the lines there of the names um, of um, the stone of Rio Brani, son of... Puno Valis. Anyway, we don't really know exact, the exact date of this stone, but we're looking at um, a, a time frame between the sort of 5th, 6th to the 8th centuries. And these are a phenomenon that you do get in Cornwall, as I said, which links us with um, others, other parts of the Atlantic seaboard. So anyway, so that's our sort of basic backstory to when we start to look at a place like Tintagel and how that is connected at this period to this wider landscape. This slide um, gives you a very good idea of uh, quite an extraordinary piece of landscape. It's a massive promontory sticking out into the Bristol Channel on the north coast of Cornwall, in a fairly remote part of Cornwall, which today is quite remote. You have to travel to get there. You can't get there by train, anyway. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a big rock sticking out into the channel. It's not an island because it's um, connected to the mainland uh, by a very narrow neck, which would have been much wider um, in prehistory in the, at this period um, but it has eroded away through time. And on it, um, it's covered in ruins. It's absolutely covered in ruins. It's, it's about six to he eight hectares in extent. You've got very high cliffs. The terrain is very rocky. It's very challenging. It's very exposed. It's the most inhospitable place you'd ever want to spend any time in, except on a sunny day. Um, well, that's... It's, it's a challenging place to build anything. It's a challenging place even to contemplate living on any permanent basis. Anyway, there's nothing ordinary about this site because it's got, it's, there's so many different stories, multi-layered stories, historical, mythological, and archaeological. And my job as an archaeologist is to look at the archaeology and try to make sense of it and try to um, understand how it has this major role within Europe, Northwest Europe, during our period that we're interested in. Um, some of you may have been there, some of you may, but it is it's definitely a place that 
you have to go to experience to sort of really understand how extraordinary it is. Okay, that's enough about how extraordinary it is. But there's nothing, there's nothing ordinary about it when we look at it with this backstory that I've given you. So you can see some of the ruins there, you can see the, the garden at the top, you can see the chapel, you can see the outlines of earthworks. And down at the bottom here, you can see the, the upper Barbican and the, the outer ward of a medieval castle. So when you go to visit Tintagel today, you will go through this kind of portal of different historical ruins, which date um, to different periods. And the first thing you will see is you will see this um, medieval castle, probably built by Earl Richard of Cornwall, one of the wealthiest barons um, in Britain, the brother of Henry III, um, spent all his wealth building castles all over southern, Brit southern Britain, and Tintagel is one place which um, he, he built his castle. Um, but it's not really, um, it's very remote, it's very um, diminutive really in terms of a, state, um, a castle. It's more like a statement, a statement of ownership or even a statement which is in capturing some of the power and significance of this place in the 12th century, a place which has great significance 800 years uh, previously. So um, I haven't got a pointer, but on the left, on the bottom slide here, you'll see the, the curtain wall and you'll see a pathway which visitors come through. When you go through the curtain wall, you, you leave the medieval zone the late, in, and you come into the, the rest of the headland. And it's in this part of the headland where we're finding um, traces of much earlier settlement, as well, actually, as well as underneath the, the area of the Great Hall. Um, but we'll come back to that in a minute. So this very um, lovely and dynamic picture um, brought together by John Norden, a traveller a traveller to Cornwall, um, who came obviously to visit the place, um, made, made a drawing, made a very a good picture, and obviously had talked to local people. And you can see by this period, by the, the early part of the 17th century, we've got ruins, We've got the severe erosion severing the headland from the mainland. So we've got somebody scampering up the, the cliff face there to get to the uh, other part of the um, medieval castle. Um, but what's interesting is that Norden must have spoken to a local person, pointing to things from the other side of the, the bay, saying, what is that? What is that? Um, in order to give the ruins numbers and to actually... Um, describe what the ruins are. So we've got number five, for example, which is the old chapel, which is still there, and number um, six, which is the um, a place of fresh water, showing where one of the major springs is. But for our purposes, for our uh, so this is very fascinating because it shows us a ruined place, um, a nugget of fossilized archaeology and ruins, um, untouched and ripe for investigations by archaeologists in the 21st century. For our purposes, uh, where, it's got, where you see number four on this little map, uh, it says, buildings fallen into the sea. And that's the area that I'm going to be talking about um, when I talk about our excavations um, in due course. So that's really very interesting. Um, and of course, uh, a lot of people associate uh, Tintagel with, the, with Arthur, uh, the alleged birthplace of King Arthur, principally through texts written by Geoffrey of Monmouth in the 12th century, where um, Tintagel is named as the birthplace of Arthur. And since then, we've had um, the Mark and Tristan cycle in medieval literature, and of course, the development of modern day tourism, cultural tourism, pilgrimage, Tintagel is a place of pilgrimage for people interested in looking for King Arthur, uh, quite rightly so. So King Arthur is very much embedded as part of the mythology of this landscape and part of the narrative there, which one has to take on board when you're, when you're looking. Um, it's, a part, it's a powerful placemaker, the, the story of uh, a local person with power 
uh, whether it's King Arthur or not is, is, is another matter. But this, the, these have all framed the historical narratives which have been handed down to us today when we, when we look at this place. This is the new statue commissioned by English Heritage which was put onto the headland, well, it's might, maybe not so new, new now, but in 2015, I think. And um, it is a very powerful um, and quite a visceral sort of statement. But all the, um, so we've got the, uh, the whole legacy of writers and artists creating and helping to create the stories of Tintagel and Arthur, making it a very powerful um, uh, framework, uh, a narrative in which to sort of navigate when you're looking at the actual stones and the, the ruins themselves. Okay, so we've got principally a headland full of stone buildings, bursting with ruins. A lot of them we don't know the dates of, quite frankly. But there were uh, the interest within, we don't know the dates, when I, when I say Frank, quite, we, 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 we suspect we know the dates, but some areas have not been dated very accurately. So we have this interesting variety of single-roomed chambers put on, built on terraces on the eastern side of the headland, buildings on the top, the summit where the chapel is, underneath the chapel. We've got something called the Iron Gate, where there's the tunnel, there's the wells. So there's a whole sort of series of earthworks and stoneworks for which we uh, have been given names, but we don't, but are all part of a sort of accumulated history of the place and the place it's being made. What you can see down there on the right-hand side is the curtain wall of the, the medieval castle, and a lot, a lot of that was largely re rebuilt by the constable of the castle in the 1850s, the Reverend Kingsman. Not all of it, but that was falling down. So this intense interest in place uh, meant that, um, well, some, something uh, meant, meant that more and more people were visiting, more and more people wanted to know what they were looking at. Um, I'm just... Um, Yes, I've forgotten. So this is just a sort of summary, really, of what we can say historically in, in, in black here from the 12th to the 14th centuries. There's a medieval castle. There's, there's um, evidence that there were, it was used as a prison in the sort of later medieval period. It's abandoned totally as a place by the, by the 18th, 19th centuries. And then in our modern day, it's become a major tourist attraction, a global destination for, for modern day pilgrims. But it's the, the bits in red on the top of our summary timeline that we're interested in, in trying to explore what's happening. And our project has been looking at the pre-medieval history of this place. Right, so archaeology. What does archaeology do? Well, archaeology, uh, archaeology is there to do lots of different things. And as I said, the more interest in, in visiting Tintagel as a place meant there was a lot of pressure on the headland, certainly in the uh, uh, visitor pressure in terms of causing physical erosion to the headland and the ruins. Um, so so the, there was a decision by the Duchy of Cornwall to put the whole headland into state care in the 1930s. And that meant that the Ministry of Works uh, the, um, the predecessors of English heritage today uh, took, the, took over the management of this place as, as more people wanted to visit. Um, but they, they didn't know how to present it because uh, so little really was known about these stone ruins and buildings. So they appointed uh, an Oxford scholar, uh, Courtney Arthur Raleigh Radford, here seen in this slide with his beret on. He also dug at Glastonbury Abbey. Uh, he dug uh, a, 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 um, across uh, many sites in Britain, and he is the godfather of early medieval archaeology in Britain. Um, he was appointed to carry out some excavations, and his excavations were all about tidying up the site, uh, reconstructing some of the stone walls which had collapsed on some of the uh, places uh, that you can see on the map here. This, new, this survey was done as part of this understanding the place, and you can see uh, in black the outlines of many buildings, some single room buildings, some double room buildings. And those are the various sites that Radford excavated and tidied up in the late, in, in the 50s, sorry, in the 1930s and also in the 1950s. And uh, he also investigated something called the Great Ditch, 
there's a massive great ditch which is just off this side unfortunately um, which which is also part of the um, the archaeology of the earthworks you have to take into account um, so his work was groundbreaking in terms of establishing um, a settlement he found evidence in terms of pottery which he didn't actually recognize until the 1950s the significance of but he said the, these are pre norman there's a pre norman settlement here possibly a late Roman settlement, and um, he interpreted what he was seeing in terms of the arrangement of buildings um, as possibly the site of uh, an early Christian um, monastic um, state. Um, as I say, the, the, the whole study of medieval archaeology was just starting in the 20s and 30s in this country, so nobody really had any references to, to look at material and say, oh yes, that's definitely 6th century or that's 8th century. Um, but the material that um, Radford found was uh, at Tintagel, the main pottery, was this extraordinary uh, material coming from outside Britain rather than from, from Cornwall. Um, it wasn't published until 20 years later because other sites in Ireland and in Somerset were starting to find um, sherds of import, late Roman imported pottery. And these are sherds are from storage vessels called amphora and some um, vessels which are fineware, tableware. And all this is coming from the distant Mediterranean basement. This is the paper, the groundbreaking paper. So, um, so Radford is really very key for us to start to get a handle on this place in terms of its chronology. And when we look at the distribution of late Roman, um, post-Roman imported pottery into Britain, we can see that there's very much an Atlantic distribution. And Tintagel's got the biggest red blob. This is what we're talking about. These types of containers for wine and olive oil that are traveling here from over 3,000 kilometers away and end up on this, um, this amazing promontory on the north coast of Cornwall. Uh, the, the dish at the top of this slide is um, African red slip, where it's fine tableware, and um, its sherds of that are also ending up at Tintagel. So the question is why, and the question is what does it all mean? <laughs> um, so Radford was the key, as I said, the key archaeologist that set down the foundation for our understanding and bringing Tintagel into this sphere of early medieval research and looking at it in terms of um, a, a very important site. So his work was, was as I said, was principally, uh, he, 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 he laid down that foundation, the ruins were restored, and the, mon and the site for over 70 years has been presented as an, an early monastic site. Now people be began to rethink all this in, in, the, in the 80s, and, um, the late Professor Charles Thomas, who I used to work with in Cornwall, and he introduced me to Tintagel over 30 years ago, he um, instigated a new research project which took place in the 1990s. Uh, and this time, um, a, um, a team from the University of Glasgow, led by Chris Morris, carried out a series of excavations for 10 years on one particular, on one area of the, of the headland, uh, because he wanted to bring modern day dating techniques and wanted to look at the stratigraphy, which is what all archaeologists are interested in when we look at the layers within these sites. And Chris's work, which was published in 2007, was the first time that we have scientific dating backing up some of the claims about the, the, the imported um, ware coming um, to this site. Uh, the work that Glasgow did was very much confined to looking again at areas that Radford's team in the 1930s had already dug. So it was very much looking at again and assessing stratigraphy. But the key important thing about the Glasgow work was that the, he started to, um, was the production of radiocarbon dates, quite broad-based radiocarbon dates, we have to say, in the, in, in, um, with the knowledge that we have today. Um, so that's principally... Um, and it may surprise you to know this, that they are, they are the, those, those are the two major campaigns of archaeological research that's taken place at Tintagel um, 
since the 1920s, since the, uh, since the site went into um, guardianship. Um, I should say also, I've forgotten, but um, most of Radford's excavations on Tintagel were not published as very detailed monographs. They were published as a series of papers. So there's always been this kind of knowledge about the importance of Tintagel, but really the detail underpinning um, the importance of it has never been fully um, in the public domain. Anyway, so um, we come today to, to uh, looking at the site today, and there was, um, we, we know far more. There was a fire on the headland in the 1980s, particularly across the top of the headland, and suddenly um, the number of earthworks um, just ex incrementally um, expanded. So every, all those sort of rather garish green dots on this map show it's slightly invisible. They're not that visible to the, to the trained eye, if you like, uh, across the whole headland. So suddenly we're seeing some, a completely different type of uh, settlement, if you like, because there's far more there than meets the eye. Um, Radford was not really aware of this, although he did visit the site in the 1990s and he was fascinated to know that there was far more in the way of buildings there. So when we look at a plan like this, this is completely unparalleled within Britain, uh, within Northwest Europe at this time, if what we're looking at is the map of a proto-urban settlement dating to the 5th and 6th centuries. I'm not suggesting that is the case because obviously there's a greater deal of complexity, which I will reveal to you when we talk about the work we did on the Southern Terrace. But suddenly we have a completely different picture of, of this whole place. It doesn't look like a round. What type of settlement are we looking at? Are we looking at uh, uh, a place which is, um, well, like a pro proto-urban site, which is very unparalleled, as I, as I say. So the arrow down at the bottom there shows the area of excavations um, that I'm going to talk about now. And the project has been called Tintagel Castle Archaeological Research Project, TCARP for, for short, and it is a project um, which has been commissioned by English Heritage Trust uh, in order to improve interpretation about the site and present that. And part of my job is to, to do what I'm doing today, is to spread the word about the, the results of our research. And our research was focused on an area of the headland that had never been looked at before, um, and it was on a place called the Southern Terrace, uh, where there were a series of earthworks, so grassed over bumps, um, on this terrace, which were surveyed, as I said, in the 1980s. And we, were, we had scheduled monument consent, so we had a licence to open up a particular area to investigate whether... Um, whether we're looking at um, buildings which have just been grassed over. We did two seasons of excavation here, one in 2016 where we did a slot trench just to test how, how good the survival of archaeology was and then we found it was very good so we came back in 2017 and we opened up a much larger area shown here in pink and we removed over 400 cubic metres of soil, rubble, Sand, um, Meredith will tell you that there's lots of buckets in the process of being used. You got very fit working at Tintagel, and it's not for softies because it's a very tough site to work on. Uh, but over, over five weeks, uh, a team, a wonderful team of 40 uh, experienced volunteers uh, working under the direction of myself, James Gossip, and a few professional archaeologists. And um, um, this is looking down onto our excavations. So this is the uh, what we call the Southern Terrace. Uh, right in the top background there, you'll see the edges of the medieval castle. But principally, uh, and on the left-hand side of the slide, you've got a, a cliff face. You've got a high cliff face, which, which has been partly quarried for stone. Anyway, so principally, you've got a fairly level piece of ground. Now, this is one of the few level pieces of ground on the edges of the headland, because it's a very lumpy, bumpy place. And actually, it's a very difficult place to build anything, as well as being very expensive. Uh, exposed. Um, but once we took off the grass, the, the maritime sward, the thin topsoil, we were starting to get stone walls, stone buildings appear like, as if by magic. 
And this is what it looked like at the end of the excavation after five weeks. And what you're looking at here has never been seen before and all, uh, all predates the medieval castle at Tintagel. So these are buildings and middens and artificial terraces which are stuffed full of archaeology, very rich archaeology, which we're, we've been able to sample because obviously five weeks tremendous achievement one can only partially excavate various bits of the site anyway so we've got pr principally we've revealed for the first time a whole series of stone buildings and middens and a terrace uh, which i say which as i said it's never seen before and if you go right to the end of the excavation trench you can just see at the top part of the slide there beyond that green fence the, the cliff just falls sharply away to the sea so and this is the location that Norden had, had numbered number four, buildings falling into the sea. So what we're looking at here is just a small element of probably lots of buildings uh, at one stage, a thousand years, 800,000 years ago, um, all the way down, because you've got a lot of erosion that's gone on that side of the headland. Okay, so... Um, here we are. This is what archaeologists are interested in. They're in rocks, layers, stratigraphy. We read the stratigraphy to get the idea of the time zones. Um, principally, we've got... Oh, I'll just go back to the other slide because it's the important thing to show you is that um, this terrace, which slightly slopes, but it's a wide ter terrace, is mainly... The upper part is mainly the hard rock, the natural rock of the headland, bedrock, and beyond the, uh, the big fat wall that you see running um, on the top building there, beyond that, that wall is sitting upon made ground. That wall is sitting upon foundation material, midden material, that has been dumped there to create a solid, or a, 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 as much as a solid sur surface foundation as possible for that wall to be built. So, and that falls sharply away down towards the sort of cliff edge. So when we look at the major section, the section drawing, the red line you see there at the bottom, that is the surface of the, of the natural geology. That's, that's, that's the bedrock. And you can see that it's been cut away to create a terrace. Beyond um, the wall in the centre of that section there, you can see a, a dotted red line, and that's, be that's an estimated depth of the made up ground because we obviously didn't right get down to right down to bedrock there so that which means that the original headland geology is much further down so this is as much as we revealed so there's over 1.5 meters of stratigraphy um, across this whole terrace mm -hmm. and of course um, one season five weeks we couldn't explain everything but we took uh, massive samples and you can see that down at the bottom on the right hand side of the slide you've got a the section through a wall a slate wall which is sitting upon made ground upon what a midden material and middens uh, are very exciting for archaeologists because they always contain lots of really interesting things one of the key results uh, for us is a, a, um, a robust scientific dating program um, which the specialist team led by Professor Alex Bayliss at Historic England um, helped um, us take samples from the material remains found in those deposits and we were able to construct with Bayesian modelling um, a very robust scientific dating programme which has allowed us to say with confidence uh, the various major events that are happening on this terrace. There are three major events. Phase one, which is the one that we're all interested, well, we're interested in all of them, but the, the phase one, middle to late 5th to early 6th centuries, uh, we've, we've got activity there um, at that time. We've got something going on there in the uh, post 7th to 9th um, um, period, but we don't actually know exactly what's happening there, but we've got some indication of that. And then we've got another major event when a couple of stone buildings were built on top of all those as well. So, so we've got a very complicated site. We've got layers of time. We've got archaeology at considerable depth. And we now 
look, when we look at other parts of the headland, we know that some of the other buildings that Radford excavated are sitting upon, were sitting upon earlier buildings as well. So as, you, as I said, um, I'm laboring the point a bit, but you've got a, very, a lot of stratigraphy, deep complex stratigraphy and a lot of events going on. What we were, what we were interested in, because we don't know, um, what we were interested in beyond all that was trying to find any evidence for the survival of very, very early buildings on the headland. And we think we found the fragment of walling of a, a building dating to uh, the late 5th, early 6th century in one part of the site on the lower part of the terrace. There's a very distinctive architectural walling where you've got large slates being set up as orthostats. They're set upright. And above that, you've got this sort of uh, coarse masonry of flat slates. And that survives on one part um, on the lower part of the southern terrace. And we've got a radiocarbon dates which show us that this building probably was in use um, for a baby less than 20 years. So it's, it's built rapidly and it's used and then it falls out of abandonment. We don't know the full extent of this building um, because we haven't, we should, we haven't, we need to go back and excavate further. But what we also have is we have uh, floor surfaces with uh, open hearths and there's one, uh, in this slide here you can see this sort of heart-shaped slate which forms the, the, the the floor or the, the footing for a, an open fire. You can see the soil is burnt around it. Um, but we also have um, massive midden deposits. Now, middens are rich, organic rich, artifact rich dumps of soil and stone which have been um, dumped um, by people who are there principally. And um, it's the middens that uh, are, are quite extraordinary particularly for the survival of organic remains like animal bone and plant seed remains, which are fairly rare, certainly at Tintagel, and fairly rare in um, the acidic uplands of, of Cornwall. Okay. Um, and I can't sort of emphasise more the fact that th it's very rare to get this kind of buried sequences um, on sites in Cornwall with this deep stratigraphy. Um, you might get it more up country. You're certainly getting it in urban places, um, Southampton, London, places where you've got good, uh, well, yeah, places where you've got good preservation. Um, so we got very excited. Obviously, we were looking at pig, pig jaws, cattle, a leg, cat, a legs of cattle, articulated animal bone, which is extraordinary. That means that it's not just one bone, but you've got bones which. Uh, um, have obviously been part of the leg of an animal, uh, cattle, which means that we can say that we, we've got uh, cattle, pigs, uh, a roe deer, sheep, goat, horse, uh, horses being brought onto the headland and um, being butchered and slaughtered for food. Um, we're looking at young, um, mainly young animals, and particularly pigs for this first phase, the, this period, the, the fifth to sixth centuries, we've got a lot of evidence for pigs being consumed. Um, they're being brought on, not fully mature, mature young sub-adults. Sub and as I said, they're being brought on as whole animals and then they're being um, slaughtered, eaten, and then they're just being disposed of, more or less where they've been um, eaten, um, butchered and, and, and eaten. Um, and all that is just totally new information. Obviously, uh, as I said, we, we're looking at samples of very rich middens, so there's, there's more there that's still buried. Anyway, uh, we've got some indication of um, a, a, few, a few fish bones, uh, but they're not, uh, they don't form a major part of the assemblage. We've got a few chicken bones. But also we have within the middens um, a lot of charred sewer remains, and they are very important because it's the first time that we've got such a rich assemblage of charred cereal remains where we can say something about not just the, the diet and the, the animals that are being brought on and consumed on the headland, but also something about the, um, the other aspects of consumption, uh, the foods that people were, were, were eating. 
barley hulled and naked barley is very um, tends to dominate the the main phase, the phase one, and some of the material has been sprouted and charred and sprouted, and we think that people were making beer um, at, at, at this time. We've got a few oats um, at, for, for the first phase and a few legumes as well. Um, importantly, uh, we don't have any evidence for um, arable farming directly on site because there's very, very few um, arable weeds in with the, uh, or even wheat chaff in with the um, plant remains, which means that we are getting a set, we're getting the occupants of Tintagel at this time drawing in from the immediate hinterland and the wider hinterland resources in order to consume on the headland. We've also got burnt seaweed, which was quite interesting. And um, we're, we're burnt seaweed being deliberately burnt, perhaps for making black salt, perhaps for um, food preservation, salting food, maybe for storage. Or it could be used for glass making. Um, it could also be used as a sealant. All the evidence, um, all the evidence is dumped and accumulated very rapidly according to the radiocarbon dates. We're looking at a sort of a time frame of maybe 20 years, um, and it's all fresh. So it's it's not come from a long way away. It's it's, it's dumped more or less where you've eaten it. So you know, cut like from here to there. So. So that's really quite extraordinary. Um, and also, the, um, it, it all sort of speaks to us of um, events where people are gathering and they are consuming lots. So it's a feasting kind of events, uh, consumption of conspicuous display of disposal, kind of suggests that the people that are doing this are able to do this because they can. So we're looking at, we think, you know, typical sort of, not every, every person's behaviour, but elite behaviours. The evidence for making beer is very fascinating. It's the first time it's ever been identified, certainly on a site of this period um, in, in Cornwall. Oh, this is P Penny Baker, uh, sorry, this is Polly Baker's slide of where, where a lar large bits of articulated bits of pig jaws and animal bones were picked up around the midden. So, um, but that's great. But also, more important, equally importantly, we have a huge amount of fragments of these import, late Roman imported amphora and um, fine wares. And with these are large fragments, and these are um, dumped into the mid midden deposits. Over 2,000 sherds uh, were found just in the small area we excavated. So that adds now to the inventory of imported material that's already documented for Tintagel. To take, so we're looking at a lot, of, a lot of material, a lot of pottery, which is exotic. It's coming from a distant world to this place. Um, Maria Duggan, Dr. Maria Duggan at the University of Newcastle is studying this material for us. Uh, she's identified uh, sherds with graffiti, uh, dipinti, painted graffiti, um, and this is a sort of summary of her work. We've got, just in the area we excavated, over 40 vessels, 25 amphora, so that means those, those um, storage, handled storage vessels containing some kind of luxury good like wine or olive oil, and then we've got the, the, the fine dishes, which um, <coughs> tableware and uh, for, commu for communal eating and sharing of, of foods. Um, the bulk of the material is from the Eastern Mediterranean um, and the late Roman one and late Roman two amphora sherds are the most common in terms of the groups. And we've got a very early dates with these because they are all associated with the middens. Very high quality uh, for Britain and it really does have the largest uh, number of imported pottery uh, from anywhere else in, in the British Isles. Uh, but there's more there, so, you know, um, who knows exactly how many were. So this is a very, very important indicator of connectivity with the world beyond uh, the shorelines in Cornwall. Uh, we've got new types of amphora that have never been identified before in previous excavations. Megan's holding up here the spike of a particular type of... Um, long amphora, which may well have come from um, Vigo area um, in northwest Spain, Galicia, 
and uh, it's not been found in Britain before. Vigo is a, a massive and very prosperous emporium in the late Roman period um, and in the post-Roman period. Um, it's both making stuff, amphora, salt, glass, and it's just distributing stuff. It's, it's, it's a place where there's been a lot of archaeology done into, uh, for this period, and uh, so we, we're, um, we're very excited that we're able to, to sort of work with some of the researchers in that part of the world. Um, so the volume of material is quite considerable. It's interesting to try to work, work out why it's there, think about why it's there. It's a good mix showing greater complexity and maritime connectivity over time. Uh, in this slide here, Maria is working in the Feech Laboratory at British School in Athens, and she has taken some of the material from Dintagel to look for the sources of the clay that make, that make up the pots that we are recognising at the site. And she's able to, her work is, this separate work is being refunded by the British, British Academy, and she's been working with um, Dr. Evangelio Kiriatsi and Naomi Muller at the Fitz, Fitz Gallery. And we're looking at material coming from um, southeast modern day Turkey, uh, F, uh, um, Fetia, that part of Turkey, the coastline there, some from the Peloponnese, the Greek mainland, um, some from the wider Ephesus area, and then some of these amphora, particularly amphora I'm talking about here, sorry if I didn't make that quite clear. Uh, also coming from Spain. So we've got a bit of everything coming from different parts of the, the Mediterranean basement and parts of the, uh, the edges of the Atlantic seaboard. So you can see um, right on the edge of the slide the, the location of Vigo where we think we've got connectivity as well. We've also got some D-ware, which is a, a particular type of um, Aquitaine pottery, which is found in sort of southwest France, which is also appearing at Tintagel. Maria's provided us with this slide. We've also got stuff we've never seen before and stuff we don't actually know what it is, imported coursewares. By that, I mean things which aren't containers for luxury goods, but um, possibly um, the coursewares are cooking pots of the people that are on these boats, presumably these ships, a variety of ships coming up um, from the eastern part of the Mediterranean and eventually turn and coming up the Atlantic seaboard and making their way up towards um, the southwest, southwest Britain. There's a handle from a juglet, possibly from Antioch, so the Levant is now pulled in. So we've got possibly uh, either, <laughs> either wider connectivity further to the east, we, we don't know. How many sea voyages? It's difficult to estimate. You need to work out how many amphora you can get into a boat and uh, how, you, how you can exchange those boats. Uh, I, don't, I'm not, I don't think we're thinking that it's one boat coming from one place and ending up in another place. It might be um, a series of, of, of what they call cabotage, where a boat docks in at another place, offloads its cargo onto another boat, and it moves around. Um, it looks like there's a bit of everything coming to Tintagel at this very defined period, um, which is just quite fascinating. It feels like we're talking about a special consignment for a special person, client, anyway. Okay, we've also got glass, and uh, I think Meredith found a couple of pieces of glass. I think she got very excited. I remember her finding it. Because it is very exciting, and uh, glass... Very fine glass, decorated glass, white trail glass. Um, when Chris Morris dug on the, on the headland in the 1990s, uh, he had 17 pieces, and we've trebled that with our, with our bits of glass. So, um, but these are all coming from um, drinking vessels, drinking bowls, and um, cone vessels. And on the right-hand side of the slide here, you can see the, the long... Um, rounded bases, drinking vessels. These are, these are glasses and things which presumably are passed around the, the, the cup that never gets put down because you're sharing. This is how we interpret the sharing drinking culture that we're seeing going on there. Uh, what else can we say? Some pieces are a bit early and um, Sarah Painter at Historic England, uh, a glass materials science, uh, materials archaeologist, working with Rachel Tyson, who's a glass specialist, 
Uh, they have, we, we managed to get permission to do a little bit of destructive analysis on some of the material. So we now, t to find out something about the source of the origin of the glass, and we now know that some raw glass, uh, the, the raw glass that is made into gla glass vessels um, from Natron comes from Egypt, probably transported by ships to um, workshops um, in France where we've got some evidence for um, glass workshops. Anyway, so another form of luxury good appearing at this site. Um, this, is, this is rather background stuff, but we've also got evidence for metalworking going on. So we've got fragments of crucibles and a stone mould, which was found, um, a tin ring down at the bottom there. So we've got evidence, but we don't have any structural evidence. We don't have any workshops or furnaces, but we've got the detritus of metalworking at evidence going on as well in the background, which is really very interesting. This too is, is very new information. And, it, um, and we've got um, iron, iron knives, so they must have been used for cutting up all the meat that people were eating. Anyway, um, Okay, so the other thing that we've got is we've got um, text. And uh, there was a, 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 um, a stone, a slate stone with some Latin text written on it, um, found in the 1990s work called the Artogni stone, um, became known as the Arthur stone. Um, but we found text, um, we found inscribed text on a flat piece of slate built into a wall um, on the edges of our midden. And um, that's my colleague James. Gossip pointing to it after we had taken off some stone, which was blocking uh, the, the, the slate. And my other colleague, uh, Wynne Scott from English Heritage, showing um, to the press, the world, um, this text. This is what it looks like. Seven lines of text in Latin, Britonic, and there's some Greek monograms um, on the um, this rather rough piece of stone. It looks like one hand. It's like a cartouche, and Michelle Brown, Professor, Professor Michelle Brown and Dr. Oliver Padell, who've been studying the text, uh, suggest that we're looking at somebody who is practicing their writing. And this is what they've interpreted on the text. Um, Tito, the first line, you're, um, the, the second line, um, perhaps um, defined as a personal name or, or perhaps um, Euro duo, two men, sons of, and then we've got Boo Dick too, and um, I'm told that they are all Britannic male vernacular names. Um, the, 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 the text shows an affinity with illuminated manuscripts um, and also with the monumental um, epigraphy that, that we get in Western Britain, those inscribed stones that I showed you very early on in, the, um, in, the, um, in my talk. So that's very exciting. The stone, we think, has been repurposed. It's probably come from somewhere else and used for the walling material, rather than, the t rather than the stone being, rather than the writing appearing on the stone in situ. Um, OK, so standing back, we've got this is digital image of the entire excavation trench. And I have been concentrating mainly, as I said, on the, the early stuff on the southern terrace. But we've got, uh, as you can see, the outlines of stone walls of buildings, both on the, the, the left-hand side of the slide and right at the top. Um, the walls that you see at the bottom uh, are a bit more complicated because they're, not, they're, not, they're, they're actually walls that appear um, sequentially. They're not part of a single coherent building. Um, these are the buildings. We've got two buildings, um, which, as I said, never been revealed before. They were covered over in brass, and the preservation is just quite extraordinary. Um, these buildings, there's one right at the top of the terrace with a principal room and a small cell, an annex attached to it. These date to a much later period, so, but, but these are, are looking, we're looking at so activity here happening in the pre-castle era. Um, radiocarbon dated to you know, 1045 to 1085. And with the Bayesian modelling, we're, we're also allowed to estimate that we might be looking at the buildings having a history which might be less than 100 years in use. What they're used for is another, is another 
um, challenge to, to work out because there's nothing very distinctive apart from the fact there's stone steps leading up to this building and you've got these very thick walls. They are very impressive buildings and there's a huge amount of effort that's gone into their investment. Um, but there is associated uh, with the areas um, of the building, plant remains have been found and we've got sprouting oat grains. So um, our expert looking at the, the plant material does suggest that maybe these are functional buildings and they are used not as residential dwelling houses, but may, maybe they're used in the, um, the, uh, as malting houses to dry grain and, and to make beer. A tradition that started several hundred years earlier is still continuing on. But we don't really know the historical context of these buildings. That's the challenge because... Previously, there's always been the assumption that there's been a gap of nothing happening at Tintagel from at least the, um, the end of the 6th century up until the um, 12th century when a chapel was built. And just to I'll rapidly go through these, but these are very amazingly well-preserved walls. It looks as though the buildings are, are neglected, they're abandoned, they just fall to ruin, nature takes over. And this is another building which is built across the width of the terrace. And here we're, looking, we're recording um, the, 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 the natural neglect of the walls because they're, that all the slate is bonded by natural clay rather than mortar. So they are, they are very early buildings and it's very rare to see buildings of this date in such good condition, uh, even though they're um, archaeological ruins. Um, you know, it's very rare to see them because buildings of this period uh, just have disappeared from, the, from our countryside, from our landscape. Um, another exciting find was this rather ugly pot. Um, not this whole pot here, that's, a re that's one from another site, Gwythian, uh, but Tracy is holding the edge of um, part of what we call a, a bar lug vessel. These are very distinctive to the southwest, particularly to Cornwall. They are part of a very vigorous uh, potting industry that's going on when the rest of Britain hasn't got any pots, particularly Wales. Um, it's very distinctive and we've got, that came out of the Midden, dating to phase two, dating to the eighth and ninth centuries. This is the first time we found this material at Tintagel, which suggests that it hasn't, as a place, its um, significance might have fallen a little bit, but it's not off the radar. It's still there within holding its significance, holding its um, power uh, within the wider landscape. Um, it doesn't look like much, does it? And in fact, you know, when you look at the collection of local coarse pots, or locally made pots uh, within Tintagel as a whole, it's very small compared to the volume of imported material. So that's really very interesting. But we know that the clays for these pots were coming or being um, extracted made into pots from the lizard area which is uh, you know, some distance away in southwest Cornwall, probably over 60 kilometres away uh, so people are bringing complete vessels um, and, uh, to, to Tintagel at this time, but it's very interesting that the, the assemblages are very very small and that goes also for, for the work that was also the case that um, the results from the earlier excavations as well. So that's a very interesting kind of um, thing to explain, really. Uh, these, this is just a plan of the, the two buildings that are there in the um, uh, pre-conquest pre period and the bottom part of the site we think has been uh, abandoned and neglected by this stage. OK, I'm rapidly coming to the end, but this is the Southern Terrace. On the bottom of the, of, of, on the slide here, you can see just the, the edge of the trench that we excavated across the bottom terrace. We are looking across from the headland onto the mainland, and in the distance there, you can see the church tower of St. Mementeriana, the parish church of Tintagel. It's a Norman tower. Um, in the early 1990s, I worked with Charles Thomas, um, excavating in the churchyard. The reason we were excavating in the churchyard is a long and another story, but uh, um, in this slide, actually in the slide at the bottom here, you'll see Charles Thomas and Raleigh Radford in 1991 um, talking at our excavations, and that was the first. That was great to have that photograph. Anyway, so um, 
how does the immediate hinterland fit into the story of the uh, post-Roman settlement um, at Tintagel? Um, we published our results, called it from Grave News from Tintagel. We were digging in the churchyard because in the 1940s, the vicar at Tintagel had dug a great big hole in a mound on the north side of the churchyard and had, had, had uncovered some early graves. The black and white photograph of those, uh, the slate line kiss, the, the, the graves that you see there, uh, we revealed again in 1991. Fortunately, very, few, very little in the way of human remains in situ uh, survived. Uh, but there's Charles Thomas at the top there with his, with his foot on a granite men here, which uh, we found in the churchyard and we think was a grave marker which had once um, been in situ at least a metre below the modern day ground surface today. And that was thrown out of the trench when the vicar dug there in the 1940s. But if we look at the architecture of the walled grave we see in the front cover of our report, it's very similar in terms of the way the, the stonework that you see uh, um, with the early building that we've got on the southern terrace. The key importance of this is that there is a very rich cemetery sitting under the modern-day churchyard at Tintagel. It goes beyond the, the, the walls of the modern-day churchyard. Um, but one of the key things that we found is we found sherds of amphora um, up near, on, by the graves reflecting possibly um, the fact that people were going up there and they were honouring their dead, having a drink, ha having an open fire, um, very much within the tradition of um, the late Roman, the antique world. And that's the first time, really, that we made a, a connection between the immediate hinterland and the settlement on the headland. Oh, yeah, that's that that's picture reproduced again of um, Rally Radford flying in by helicopter to visit us in 1990. Anyway, okay, so I'm, I'm sort of wrapping up. I'm building a picture now, really, of the emergence of a very distinct identity um, at this period in Cornwall. Uh, Tintagel is obviously an exceptional place when you look at it within the sort of media landscape, but it seems to be a central place that's emerging and developing, and it's possibly... Um, a place where um, somebody of high social status and standing is gathering with their retinue, with their, with their, um, with their um, followers. Um, they are, and there's tribute going on, there's hospitality going on, there's conspicuous consumption, maybe driven by the control of the importance of tin at this time. It's possible, although we haven't got any tin ingots at Tintagel, but it's possible that we are looking at um, that kind of rather um, exceptional, not routine everyday behaviour, but exceptional behaviour, perhaps on a regular basis um, throughout certain times of the year. We're not suggesting permanent settlement, but places that it's a place that, as a destination that, that people are going to in order to exchange um, tin, perhaps, maybe for um, um, other things as well, coming from from the from the distant Mediterranean world. <clears throat> so we've got all these kinds of signs, which were for special elite behaviour. Okay, so just to remind you, previously we we knew that about Tintagel on the left, and today we know far more. We, we've got an extraordinary place, which will take several lifetimes. To, to really um, get down to the bottom of. Um, if you, it's quite clear that more excavation there is highly desirable, but it has to be managed in a particular and targeted way. Um, anyway, uh, that's really kind of uh, where, where uh, my summary <laughs> of major terracing going on, buildings, stone buildings, probably a very defined um, period of, of activity settlement, um, probably in the first half of the 6th century. Um, we've got buildings upon buildings on terraces made of, cult um, terraces made of made ground, cultural material. We've got the backdrop of metal mining within the wider landscape of, tin of, Cornwall, of Cornwall, but we've also got lead and silver, mine, uh, silver loads within the local landscape of Tintagel, so it could be that they're being ex extracted and mined at the same time. Uh, a place for gathering, a distribution hub, 
making beer, perhaps seasonal feasting, animals brought, being brought onto the settlement to be consumed, conspicuous consumption, drawing in resources from the, hinter, from the hinterland. Not a place where you're growing and farming, but you're actually sucking in stuff um, from the wider hinterland with the cemetery within sight, and then that connectivity beyond Dumnonia and the, the Atlantic seaboard and other, other late antique society, uh, societies um, in the Mediterranean world. And you've got these luxury goods, you've got these luxury commodities, that's the landscapes of the elite. This rather nice little um, picture is of a, a, a deer being stalked by a dog. It's one of the few pictorial slates uh, excavated during the night, uh, found during the excavations in the 1930s, a much under-resourced, um, understudied aspect of Tintagel is that we've got um, a series of uh, graffiti slates that, um, that are part of sort of add colour and part of the background um, to our story. Uh, what is Tintagel? Well, it, it's a very complex site with lots of stories, new surfacing all the time. The archaeology is just below the surface, and uh, the new chronology. Uh, challenges us, us all as archaeologists and historians to explain uh, the significance of this place um, over this long period of time and why it has captured the wider public imagination and why it has, has found itself embedded within a national story and, and why King Arthur is connected with it too. Just to remind you, you know, we've got the, the elites um, in terms of important people within the wider landscape. This is an inscribed um, sorry, these are decorated uh, granite crosses on the southeast part of Bogwin Moor, King Doniat Stone, one of the early medieval kings that uh, um, are there in the 8th and 9th centuries. It's a very enigmatic site, but it's got an inscription to somebody called Doniat. Anyway. <coughs> uh, well, thank you for listening. Uh, obviously, uh, I can't tell you all about this without everybody who's contributed to the project. This is the list of all the specialists. Uh, there's a snapshot of some of the team, although we've got um, many other people that are part of the, the volunteer team. We did a lot of outreach while we were digging, and uh, the three guys on the top there sp spoke to you know, three or, three or 4,000 people during the whole excavation, because it is a public place. Uh, people are, um, are seeing us excavate and also asking questions as well, and uh, we're keen to share our knowledge. And, uh, uh, right, that's the end. I, um, so, yeah, Meredith did mention that the monograph, um, which is coming together now, uh, it will be published later on this year. It'll be digital, it'll be open access, and you can all read about it. <laughs> anyway, thanks very much. Thanks for listening.